Welcome to Exploration Dreamland, a quiet read aloud of the writings of explorers of the real world and the worlds of imagination. Drop anchor, relax into your comfortable bunk, and drift off to dreamland with us as we read a lightly edited version of The Last Man by Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley published in 1826. The book will be read in order, so if you would like to begin at the beginning, please start with Season 4, Episode 54. A quick content warning. This book contains occasional references to plague, pestilence, death, suicidal thoughts and actions, and in one section, brief descriptions of war and pillaging. We will try to include specific warnings in the episode descriptions, but if you prefer to avoid these topics altogether, we recommend re-listening to our previous seasons or rejoining us for our next book. If you would like to stay in touch between episodes, you can follow us on Instagram or Facebook at Exploration Dreamland. If you have a moment to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, it would help other listeners find us. You can also hear our episodes on YouTube. If you are listening there, please like our episodes and leave a comment for us. We'd love to hear from you. Now... Take a deep breath in, and as you exhale, relax any tension in your muscles. Close your eyes, snuggle into your sleeping space, and listen to tonight's tale. Chapter 6 Eventful winter passed, winter, the respite of our ills. By degrees the sun, which with slant beams had before yielded the more extended rain to night, lengthened his diurnal journey, and mounted his highest throne, at once the fosterer of earth's new beauty and her lover. We who, like flies that congregate upon a dry rock at the ebbing of the tide, had played wantonly with time, allowing our passions, our hopes, and our mad desires to rule us, now heard the approaching roar of the ocean of destruction, and would have fled to some sheltered crevice before the first wave broke over us. We resolved without delay to commence our journey to Switzerland. We became eager to leave France. Under the icy vaults of the glaciers, beneath the shadow of the pines, the swinging of whose mighty branches was arrested by a load of snow, beside the streams whose intense cold proclaimed their origin to be from the slow-melting piles of congelated waters, amidst frequent storms which might purify the air, we should find health, if in truth health were not herself diseased. We began our preparations at first with alacrity. We did not now bid adieu to our native country, to the graves of those we loved, to the flowers and streams and trees which had lived beside us from infancy. Small sorrow would be ours on leaving Paris, a scene of shame when we remembered our late contentions and thought that we left behind a flock of miserable, deluded victims bending under the tyranny of a selfish impostor. Small pangs should we feel in leaving the gardens, woods, and halls of the palaces of the Bourbons at Versailles which we feared would soon be tainted by the dead, when we looked forward to valleys lovelier than any garden, to mighty forests and halls 
built not for mortal majesty, but palaces of nature's own, with the alp of marmorial whiteness for their walls, the sky for their roof. Yet our spirits flagged as the day drew near which we had fixed for our departure. Dire visions and evil auguries, if such things were, thickened around us, so that in vain men might say, quote, These are their reasons, they are natural, end quote, from Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. We felt them to be ominous and dreaded the future event enchained to them. That the night owl should screech before the noonday sun, that the hard winged bat should wheel around the bed of beauty, that muttering thunder should in early spring startle the cloudless air, that sudden and exterminating blight should fall on the tree and shrub, were unaccustomed but physical events less horrible than the mental creations of almighty fear. Some had sight of funeral processions, and faces all begrimed with tears, which flitted through the long avenues of the gardens, and drew aside the curtains of the sleepers at dead of night. Some heard wailing and cries in the air, a mournful chant would stream through the dark atmosphere as if spirits above sang the requiem of the human race. What was there in all this but that fear created other senses within our frames, making us see, hear, and feel what was not? What was this but the action of diseased imaginations and childish credulity? So might it be, but what was most real was the existence of these very fears, the staring looks of horror, the faces pale even to ghastliness, the voices struck dumb with harrowing dread of those among us who saw and heard these things. Of this number was Adrian, who knew the delusion, yet could not cast off the clinging terror. Even ignorant infancy appeared with timorous shrieks and convulsions to acknowledge the presence of unseen powers. We must go, in change of scene, in occupation, and such security as we still hoped to find, we should discover a cure for these gathering horrors. On mustering our company, we found them to consist of fourteen hundred souls, men, women, and children. Until now, therefore, we were undiminished in numbers except by the desertion of those who had attached themselves to the impostor prophet and remained behind in Paris. About fifty French joined us. Our order of march was easily arranged. The ill success which had attended our division determined Adrian to keep all in one body. I, with a hundred men, went forward first as purveyor, taking the road of the Côte d'Or, through Auxerre, Dijon, Dole, and over the Jura to Geneva. I was to make arrangements at every ten miles for the accommodation of such numbers as I found the town or village would receive, leaving behind a messenger with a written order signifying how many were to be quartered there. The remainder of our tribe was then divided into bands of fifty each, every division containing eighteen men and the remainder consisting of women and children. Each of these was headed by an officer, who carried the roll of names by which they were each day to be mustered. If the numbers were divided at night, in the morning those in the van waited for those in the rear. At each of the large towns before mentioned, we were all to assemble, and a conclave of the principal officers would hold counsel for the general wheel. I went first, as I said, Adrian last. His mother, with Clara and Evelyn under her protection, remained also with him. 
Thus our order being determined, I departed. My plan was to go at first no further than Fontainebleau, where in a few days I should be joined by Adrian before I took flight again further eastward. My friend accompanied me a few miles from Versailles. He was sad, and in a tone of unaccustomed despondency, uttered a prayer for our speedy arrival among the Alps, accompanied with an expression of vain regret that we were not already there. In that case, I observed, we can quicken our march. Why adhere to a plan whose dilatory proceeding you already disapprove? Nay, replied he, it is too late now. A month ago, and we were masters of ourselves. Now, he turned his face from me, though gathering twilight had already veiled its expression, he turned it yet more away, as he added, A man died of the plague last night. He spoke in a smothered voice, then suddenly clasping his hands, he exclaimed, Swiftly, most swiftly advances the last hour for us all. As the stars vanish before the sun, so will his near approach destroy us. I have done my best. With grasping hands and impotent strength, I have hung on the wheel of the chariot of plague, but she drags me along with it, while, like juggernaut, she proceeds crushing out the being of all who strew the high road of life. Would that it were over! Would that her procession achieved, we had all entered the tomb together! Tears streamed from his eyes. Again and again, he continued, will the tragedy be acted. Again I must hear the groans of the dying, the wailing of the survivors, Again witness the pangs which, consummating all, envelop an eternity in their evanescent existence. Why am I reserved for this? Why the tainted weather of the flock am I not struck to earth among the first? It is hard, very hard, for one of woman born to endure all that I endure. Hitherto, with an undaunted spirit and a high feeling of duty and worth, Adrian had fulfilled his self-imposed task. I had contemplated him with reverence and a fruitless desire of imitation. I now offered a few words of encouragement and sympathy. He hid his face in his hands, and while he strove to calm himself, he ejaculated, For a few months, Yet for a few months more let not, O oh God, my heart fail, or my courage be bowed down. Let not sights of intolerable misery madden this half-crazed brain, or cause this frail heart to beat against its prison bound so that it burst. I have believed it to be my destiny to guide and rule the last of the race of man, till death extinguish my government, and to this destiny I submit. Pardon me, Verney, I pain you, but I will no longer complain. Now I am myself again, or rather, I am better than myself. You have known how from my childhood aspiring thoughts and high desires have warred with inherent disease and overstrained sensitiveness till the latter became victors. You know how I placed this wasted feeble hand on the abandoned helm of human government. I have been visited at times by intervals of fluctuation, yet until now I have felt as if a superior and indefatigable spirit had taken up its abode within me, or rather incorporated itself with my weaker being. The holy visitant has for a time slept, perhaps to show me how powerless I am without its inspiration. Yet stay for a while, O power of goodness and strength, disdain not yet this rent shrine of fleshly mortality, O immortal capability. 
while one fellow creature remains to whom aid can be afforded, stay by and prop your shattered, falling engine. His vehemence and voice broken by irrepressible sighs sunk to my heart. His eyes gleamed in the gloom of night like two earthly stars, and his form dilating, his countenance beaming. Truly it almost seemed as if at his eloquent appeal a more than mortal spirit entered his frame, exalting him above humanity. He turned quickly towards me and held out his hand. Farewell, Verney, he cried, brother of my love. Farewell. No other weak expression must cross these lips. I am alive again to our tasks, to our combats with our unvanquishable foe, for to the last I will struggle against her. He grasped my hand and bent a look on me, more fervent and animated than any smile. Then, turning his horse's head, he touched the animal with the spur and was out of sight in a moment. A man last night had died of the plague. The quiver was not emptied, nor the bow unstrung. We stood as marks, while Parthian pestilence aimed and shot, insatiated by conquest, unobstructed by the heaps of slain. A sickness of the soul, contagious even to my physical mechanism, came over me. My knees knocked together, my teeth chattered, the current of my blood, clotted by sudden cold, painfully forced its way from my heavy heart. I did not fear for myself, but it was misery to think that we could not even save this remnant. That those I loved might in a few days be as clay-cold as Idris in her antique tomb, nor could strength of body or energy of mind ward off the blow. A sense of degradation came over me. Did God create man merely in the end to become dead earth in the midst of healthful vegetating nature? Was he of no more account to his maker than a field of corn blighted in the ear? Were our proud dreams thus to fade? Our name was written a little lower than the angels, and, behold, we were no better than ephemera. We had called ourselves the paragon of animals, and, lo, we were a quintessence of dust. We repined that the pyramids had outlasted the embalmed body of their builder. Alas, the mere shepherd's hut of straw we passed on the road contained in its structure the principle of greater longevity than the whole race of man. How reconcile this sad change to our past aspirations, to our apparent powers, Sudden, an internal voice, articulate and clear, seemed to say, Thus from eternity it was decreed, The steeds that bear time onwards had this hour and this fulfillment enchained to them, since the void brought forth its burden. Would you read backwards the unchangeable laws of necessity? Mother of the world, servant of the omnipotent, Eternal, changeless necessity, who with busy fingers sittest ever weaving the indissoluble chain of events. I will not murmur at thy acts. If my human mind cannot acknowledge that all that is, is right, yet since what is, must be, I will sit amidst the ruins and smile. Truly we were not born to enjoy, but to submit and to hope. Will not the reader tire if I should minutely describe our long-drawn journey from Paris to Geneva, if, day by day, I should record in the form of a journal the thronging miseries of our lot? Could my hand write, or language afford words to express, the variety of our woe, the hustling and crowding of one deplorable event upon another. 
Patience, O reader, whoever thou art, wherever thou dwellest, whether of race spiritual or sprung from some surviving pair, thy nature will be human, thy habitation the earth. Thou wilt here read of the acts of the extinct race, and wilt ask wonderingly if they who suffered what thou findest recorded were of frail flesh and soft organization like thyself. Most true they were. Weep, therefore. For surely, solitary being, thou wilt be of gentle disposition, shed compassionate tears. But the while, lend thy attention to the tale and learn the deeds and sufferings of thy predecessors. Yet the last events that marked our progress through France were so full of strange horror and gloomy misery that I dare not pause too long in the narration. If I were to dissect each incident, every small fragment of a second would contain a harrowing tale, whose minutest word would curdle the blood in thy young veins. It is right that I should erect for thy instruction this monument of the foregone race, but not that I should drag thee through the wards of a hospital, nor the secret chambers of the charnel house. This tale, therefore, shall be rapidly unfolded. Images of destruction, pictures of despair, the procession of the last triumph of death shall be drawn before thee swift as the rack driven by the north wind along the blotted splendor of the sky. Weed-grown fields, desolate towns, the wild approach of riderless horses had now become habitual to my eyes, nay, sights far worse of the unburied dead and human forms which were strewed on the roadside and on the steps of once frequented habitations where Quote, through the flesh that wastes away beneath the parching sun, the whitening bones start forth and moulder in the sable dust. End quote from Elton's translation of Hesiod's Shield of Hercules. Sights like these had become, ah, woe the while, so familiar that we had ceased to shudder or spur our stung horses to sudden speed as we passed them. France in its best days, at least that part of France through which we traveled, had been a cultivated desert, and the absence of enclosures, of cottages, and even of peasantry, was saddening to a traveler from sunny Italy or busy England. Yet the towns were frequent and lively, and the cordial politeness and ready smile of the wooden-shoed peasant restored good humor to the splenetic. Now the old woman sat no more at the door with her distaff. The lank beggar no longer asked charity in courtier-like phrase, nor on holidays did the peasantry thread with slow grace the mazes of the dance. Silence, melancholy bride of death, went in procession with him from town to town through the spacious region. We arrived at Fontainebleau, and speedily prepared for the reception of our friends. On mustering our numbers for the night, three were found missing. When I inquired for them, the man to whom I spoke uttered the word plague and fell at my feet in convulsions. He also was infected. There were hard faces around me, for among my troop were sailors who had crossed the line times unnumbered, soldiers who in Russia and far America had suffered famine, cold, and danger, and men still sterner featured, once nightly depredators in our overgrown metropolis, men bred from their cradle to see the whole machine of society at work for their destruction. I looked round and saw upon the faces of all horror and despair written in glaring characters. We passed four days at Fontainebleau. Several sickened and died, and in the meantime neither Adrian nor any of our friends appeared. 
My own troop was in commotion. To reach Switzerland, to plunge into rivers of snow, and to dwell in caves of ice became the mad desire of all. Yet we had promised to wait for the earl, and he came not. My people demanded to be led forward. Rebellion, if so we might call what was the mere casting away of straw-formed shackles, appeared manifestly among them. They would away on the word without a leader. The only chance of safety, the only hope of preservation from every form of indescribable suffering, was our keeping together. I told them this, while the most determined among them answered with sullenness that they could take care of themselves and replied to my entreaties with scoffs and menaces. At length, on the fifth day, a messenger arrived from Adrian bearing letters which directed us to proceed to Auxerre and there await his arrival, which would only be deferred for a few days. Such was the tenor of his public letters. Those privately delivered to me detailed at length the difficulties of his situation and left the arrangement of my future plans to my own discretion. His account of the state of affairs at Versailles was brief, but the oral communications of his messenger filled up his omissions and showed me that perils of the most frightful nature were gathering around him. At first, the reawakening of the plague had been concealed, but the number of deaths increasing, the secret was divulged, and the destruction already achieved was exaggerated by the fears of the survivors. Some emissaries of the enemy of mankind, the accursed impostors, were among them instilling their doctrine that safety and life could only be ensured by submission to their chief, and they succeeded so well that soon, instead of desiring to proceed to Switzerland, the major part of the multitude desired to return to Paris, and, by ranging themselves under the banners of the so-called prophet, and by a cowardly worship of the principle of evil, to purchase respite, as they hoped, from impending death. The discord and tumult induced by these conflicting fears and passions detained Adrian. It required all his ardor in pursuit of an object, and his patience under difficulties, to calm and animate such a number of his followers as might counterbalance the panic of the rest, and lead them back to the means from which alone safety could be derived. He had hoped immediately to follow me, but, being defeated in this intention, he sent his messenger urging me to secure my own troop at such a distance from Versailles as to prevent the contagion of rebellion from reaching them, promising at the same time to join me the moment a favorable occasion should occur, by means of which he could withdraw the main body of the emigrants from the evil influence at present exercised over them. I was thrown into a most painful state of uncertainty by these communications. My first impulse was that we should all return to Versailles, there to assist in extricating our chief from his perils. I accordingly assembled my troop, and proposed to them this retrograde movement, instead of the continuation of our journey to Auxerre. With one voice they refused to comply. The notion circulated among them was that the ravages of the plague alone detained the protector. They opposed his order to my request. They came to a resolve to proceed without me should I refuse to accompany them. Argument and adjuration were lost on these dastards. The continual diminution of their own numbers effected by pestilence, added a sting to their dislike of delay, and my opposition only served to bring their resolution to a crisis. That same evening they departed towards Auxerre. Oaths, 
as from soldiers to their general, had been taken by them. These they broke. I also had engaged myself not to desert them. It appeared to me inhuman to ground any infraction of my word on theirs. The same spirit that caused them to rebel against me would impel them to desert each other, and the most dreadful sufferings would be the consequence of their journey in their present unordered and chiefless array. These feelings for a time were paramount, and, in obedience to them, I accompanied the rest towards Auxerre. We arrived the same night at villeneuve la guiard a town at the distance of four posts from Fontainebleau. When my companions had retired to rest, and I was left alone to revolve and ruminate upon the intelligence I received of Adrian's situation, another view of the subject presented itself to me. What was I doing, and what was the object of my present movements? Apparently, I was to lead this troop of selfish and lawless men towards Switzerland, leaving behind my family and my selected friend, which, subject as they were hourly to the death that threatened to all, I might never see again. Was it not my first duty to assist the protector, setting an example of attachment and duty? At a crisis, such as the one I had reached, it is very difficult to balance nicely opposing interests, and that towards which our inclinations lead us obstinately assumes the appearance of selfishness, even when we meditate a sacrifice. We are easily led at such times to make a compromise of the question, and this was my permanent resource. I resolved that very night to ride to Versailles. If I found affairs less desperate than I now deemed them, I would return without delay to my troop. I had a vague idea that my arrival at that town would occasion some sensation more or less strong of which we might profit for the purpose of leading forward the vacillating multitude. At least no time was to be lost. I visited the stables, I saddled my favorite horse, and vaulting on his back, without giving myself time for further reflection or hesitation, quitted villeneuve la guiard on my return to Versailles. I was glad to escape from my rebellious troop, and to lose sight for a time of the strife of evil with good, where the former forever remained triumphant. I was stung almost to madness by my uncertainty concerning the fate of Adrian, and grew reckless of any event except what might lose or preserve my unequaled friend. With a heavy heart that sought relief in the rapidity of my course, I rode through the night to Versailles. I spurred my horse, who addressed his free limbs to speed, and tossed his gallant head in pride. The constellations reeled swiftly by, swiftly each tree and stone and landmark fled past my onward career. I bared my head to the rushing wind, which bathed my brow in delightful coolness. As I lost sight of villeneuve la guiard I forgot the sad drama of human misery. Methought it was happiness enough to live, sensitive the while of the beauty of the verdure-clad earth, the star-bespangled sky, and the tameless wind that lent animation to the whole. My horse grew tired, and I, forgetful of his fatigue, still as he lagged, cheered him with my voice and urged him with the spur. He was a gallant animal, and I did not wish to exchange him for any chance beast I might light on, leaving him never to be refound. All night we went forward. In the morning he became sensible that we approached Versailles, to reach which as his home he mustered his flagging strength. I swiftly darted through the open portal, 
and up the majestic stairs of this castle of victories, heard Adrian's voice, and answered it with convulsive shrieks. I rushed into the hall of Hercules, where he stood surrounded by a crowd, whose eyes, turned in wonder on me, reminded me that on the stage of the world a man must repress such ecstasies. I would have given worlds to have embraced him. I dared not. Half in exhaustion, half voluntarily, I threw myself at my length on the ground. Dare I disclose the truth to the gentle offspring of solitude? I did so that I might kiss the dear and sacred earth he trod. I found everything in a state of tumult. An emissary of the leader of the elect had been so worked up by his chief and by his own fanatical creed as to make an attempt on the life of the protector and preserver of lost mankind. His hand was arrested while in the act of poniarding the earl. This circumstance had caused the clamor I heard on my arrival at the castle and the confused assembly of persons that I found assembled in the Salle d'Hercule. Although superstition and demoniac fury had crept among the emigrants, yet several adhered with fidelity to their noble chieftain, and many, whose faith and love had been unhinged by fear, felt all their latent affection rekindled by this detestable attempt. A phalanx of faithful breasts closed round him. The wretch who, although a prisoner and in bonds, vaunted his design and madly claimed the crown of martyrdom, would have been torn to pieces had not his intended victim interposed. Adrian, springing forward, shielded him with his own person and commanded with energy the submission of his infuriate friends. At this moment, I had entered. Discipline and peace were at length restored in the castle, and then Adrian went from house to house, from troop to troop, to soothe the disturbed minds of his followers and recall them to their ancient obedience. But the fear of immediate death was still rife amongst these survivors of a world's destruction. The horror occasioned by the attempted assassination passed away. Each eye turned towards Paris. Men love a prop so well that they will lean on a pointed, poisoned spear, and such was he, the impostor who, with fear of hell for his scourge, most ravenous wolf, played the driver to a credulous flock. It was a moment of suspense that shook even the resolution of the unyielding friend of man. Adrian, for one moment, was about to give in, to cease the struggle and quit, with a few adherents, the deluded crowd, leaving them a miserable prey to their passions and to the worst tyrant who excited them. But again, after a brief fluctuation of purpose, he resumed his courage and resolves, sustained by the singleness of his purpose and the untried spirit of benevolence which animated him. At this moment, as an omen of excellent import, his wretched enemy pulled destruction on his head, destroying with his own hands the dominion he had erected. His grand hold upon the minds of men took its rise from the doctrine inculcated by him that those who believed in and followed him were the remnant to be saved, while all the rest of mankind were marked out for death. Now, at the time of the flood, the Omnipotent repented him that he had created man, and as then with water, now with the arrows of pestilence, was about to annihilate all except those who obeyed his decrees, promulgated by the Ipsy Dixit prophet. It is impossible to say on what foundations this man built his hopes of being able to carry on such an imposture. It is likely that he was fully aware of the lie which murderous nature might give to his assertions 
and believed it to be the cast of a die, whether he should in future ages be reverenced as an inspired delegate from heaven, or be recognized as an impostor by the present dying generation. At any rate, he resolved to keep up the drama to the last act. When, on the first approach of summer, the fatal disease again made its ravages among the followers of Adrian, the impostor exultingly proclaimed the exemption of his own congregation from the universal calamity. He was believed. His followers, hitherto shut up in Paris, now came to Versailles. Mingling with the coward band there assembled, they reviled their admirable leader and asserted their own superiority and exemption. At length the plague, slow-footed but sure in her noiseless advance, destroyed the illusion, invading the congregation of the elect and showering promiscuous death among them. Their leader endeavored to conceal this event. He had a few followers who, admitted into the arcana of his wickedness, could help him in the execution of his nefarious designs. Those who were sickened were immediately and quietly withdrawn, the cord and a midnight grave disposed of them for ever, while some plausible excuse was given for their absence. At last a female, whose maternal vigilance subdued even the effects of the narcotics administered to her, became a witness of their murderous designs on her only child. Mad with horror, she would have burst among her deluded fellow victims, and, wildly shrieking, have awakened the dull ear of night with the history of the fiend-like crime. When the impostor, in his last act of rage and desperation, plunged a poniard in her bosom. Thus wounded to death, her garments dripping with her own life blood, bearing her strangled infant in her arms, beautiful and young as she was, Juliet, for it was she, denounced to the host of deceived believers the wickedness of their leader. He saw the aghast looks of her auditors changing from horror to fury. The names of those already sacrificed were echoed by their relatives, now assured of their loss. The wretch, with that energy of purpose which had borne him thus far in his guilty career, saw his danger and resolved to evade the worst forms of it. He rushed on one of the foremost, seized a pistol from his girdle, and his loud laugh of derision mingled with the report of the weapon with which he destroyed himself. They left his miserable remains even where they lay. They placed the corpse of poor Juliet and her babe upon a bier, and all, with hearts subdued to saddest regret, in long procession walked towards Versailles. They met troops of those who had quitted the kindly protection of Adrian and were journeying to join the fanatics. The tale of horror was recounted, all turned back, and thus at last, accompanied by the undiminished numbers of surviving humanity, and preceded by the mournful emblem of their recovered reason, they appeared before Adrian, and again and forever vowed obedience to his commands and fidelity to his cause. Stay tuned for the next segment from The Last Man by Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley. Please follow, rate, and review us on your favorite podcast app. Keep in touch with us on Instagram, Facebook, or YouTube, and recommend us to anyone you know who could use a quiet break or a little help falling asleep. Exploration Dreamland is produced edited and hosted by me, Sarah Van Zaley.
A big thank you to Project Gutenberg for helping me find many interesting publications. Thanks also to Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com for providing the theme music for this show. The title of this piece is Kalimba Relaxation Music, if you would like to visit his website to hear it in its entirety. Sweet dreams. <laughs>